Let me just give you a start. And why is it doing that? Since it's a uh, mirror image. We started? Yes. Can they hear us? They will have the delay of two things now. Okay. So, uh, can they also speak to us? They can write in comments. They can write in comments, all right. So, it's uh, there's still another five minutes to go. Yes. Okay. So, right now, who's, who can hear us? Uh, there are about five minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. 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 No, this is not this one. This is your streaming one. I think we can start later conversation only and then we'll jump into the presentation. Sorry? Uh, we have 12 people right now. Tell where all the from. Since it's free, it has a few different. Okay, so while we wait for the session to start, it's 4.59. Can we make a request and ask everybody to type in the comment section, where all is everybody from? Where, Which part of India is our people from? What city are you from? What village are you from? What tribe are you from? Can you just type that in the comment section for us to see? This is a delay of five, five seconds. So I believe there's a delay of about two to five seconds from the time that we speak to what you hear and then we receive back. Great. So we've got Paridhi from uh, Delhi. Paridhi, welcome. Uh, Janathanan from Bangalore. Vikram Paliwal from Mumbai. So great. Three distinct climate zones. Uh, one is temperate, one is hot, humid, one is composite. Vikram Paliwal from Mumbai.
okay so it's 5 o'clock so welcome everyone to this session on swaraj uh, some of you might have followed the link and seen the uh, youtube video the tedx talk on swaraj uh, this is not going to be as rushed or as um, short cut as that was there was a time constraint of 18 minutes during the tedx platform but this one is longer so welcome to this talk this talk is not about swaraj it is about you it is about your life it is about your country your locality the city that you are from and your family so without much further ado let's begin and uh, while we speak i just wanted to update you we've got people from kalyan from jaipur uh, more people from delhi and from mumbai and uh, keep writing in in the comments where you are from so that we can perhaps include you and ask you some questions about the place that you are from so for starters there is a disclaimer nothing in this presentation is true it does not constitute the truth it is merely a point of view and as is the case with, with points of view to accept it or not is your choice the earth is like a tandoori chicken and the only global constant on the planet is the amount of solar energy that we receive in watts per square meter sent to us by the sun 1361 and this is what we receive on the outer atmosphere when it reaches the earth it is about 1000 watts per square meter at the equator now if you see the image on the screen it's very interesting it can clearly you can see on the image that the darkest part of the tandoori chicken apologies to all the vegetarian people on uh, the webinar uh, you can picture a tandoori bun gobi or a patta gobi when that rotates on the fire you see that the darkest portion the part that gets cooked the most the most succulent part the richest part is the part that is closest to the fire which is the darkest in this picture that you see on the screen now the earth is divided into roughly 29 broad climate zones uh, this division was created by someone called koppen koppen was a modernist unfortunately everyone on this webinar who is listening in today is a modernist you might feel very proud that you are modern because you are an outcome of the modernist education paradigm but believe me there's nothing to be proud about modernism was the movement that started dividing the world modernism was the philosophy that brought about and also what stemmed from the industrial revolution where mankind believed that everything is a machine the human body is a machine the world is a machine the way we think is a machine and if we can understand its constituent parts then we can put those parts together and rebuild the machine from scratch unfortunately about 200 years in the future that is today we have realized that everything is not a machine and the whole is not equal to the sum of its parts but what is interesting in this division of 29 climate zones is that there is only one country in the world the size of india that has 17 of those 29 climate zones this country is our country china and america are ahead of india in terms of climate zones but they have roughly three times the land mass of india this is what the equator looks like this is what the equatorial people look like the darkest skin tones and the richest biodiversity in the world these are the mid latitudes and this is your country and its people and these are the northern latitudes and the lat and the people who belong to the northern latitudes and unfortunately the highest selling cream in india today is fairness creams in fact the latest advertisement that you see on television today because the idea of fairness had been banned by the supreme court to be advertised is a direct attack on melanin so now they don't talk about fairness they say that you can now have creams that can destroy the effect of melanin in the body unfortunately we don't understand melanin as a hormone you cannot put something on the skin and destroy the impact of melanin and melanin is what protects your body from ultraviolet radiation if you kill it you are likely to suffer the effect that a vampire suffers when they come out into direct sunlight this is the world's scientific skin tone map so you can see by this map that as you move away from the equator the same tandoori chicken phenomena you will notice that skin tones turn darker and darker and people become fairer and fairer as they move away from the equator now a lot of you might have this question that how come australia has very dark people but um, this was proven about 20 years back that the aboriginal people of australia have roots or dna structure that traces back to african people probably from the continental drift theory so the aboriginal people in australia are as dark skin toned as the african people 
The size of people also changes as you move away from the equator. So you have the Thai, the Malay, the um, uh, the pygmies at the equator, which are relatively shorter in stature and height. And as you move away from the equator, people grow taller and taller. And the Scandinavian countries, you will notice that most of our supermodels, most of the models in the uh, fashion industry are from Scandinavian countries. And in Delhi, it's not very uncommon to be driving on the road and you'll see this advertisement on auto rickshaws saying, Kad badai nahi to paisa wapas Get your money back or increase your height. In fact, the latest that I've heard is that uh, the most fashionable thing in Delhi amongst the upper circles is to have bone grafting. So they put pieces of metal in your shin bone to increase your height by half an inch to one inch. Very expensive operation apparently, but uh, they guarantee results. These are now all scientific rules. Gloger's rule, Bergman's rule, Allen's rule and Hess's rule. And you might have heard of this ridiculous uh, concept called the Olympics. So I don't know if you're aware that if you see the medal tally in the Olympics, you'll always find that the uh, countries such as China, Russia, Canada, United States and now ever so increasingly Australia have always topped the medal tally on an average. Now, it's very strange when we say that we can make people with different body size, different surface area to volume ratio, different heart to weight ratio compete with people who are from Asian countries who are in much hotter climates. The response time of the body is very different. Serotonin and melanin levels are very different. And most of the time, athletes from our countries have to rely on supplementation, sports supplements, bodybuilding supplements, all kinds of enhancement supplements to change the body, to make it look or feel or perform like an athlete from any of these countries, which is highly unnatural. Let's see what else varies this way. So Swaraj, you will notice is written with a five and we say that that five is uh, representative of Bhasha, Bhesh, Bhojan, Bhajan and Bhavan. The five bhas for the English speaking people on the in the audience, diets, dialects, dresses, dwellings, dances and songs. All these five elements constitute a culture. Now, a uh, lot of people say that cultures keep changing. Cultures are dynamic phenomena. Well, there is a culture like the fast track advertisement. I don't know if you've seen that fast track advertisement, you know, the one in which a girl breaks up with her boyfriend and then she goes a few steps ahead and uh, another boy winks at her and she winks back. And then the tagline comes and it says fast track, move on. I'm not talking about that kind of culture. I'm talking about the culture that is connected to sustainability culture that brings our life in sync with the natural environment. So we are going to go through these five elements and show you how traditionally they have always been linked with the natural environment. In fact, if we say 68% of India still lives in rural and tribal areas for 68% of India, they still live in harmony with the natural environment. But we are hell bent on making sure that they move as quickly as possible into what we call cities today. So let's start with dresses. What you will see on the screen are people from extremely hot climate. These are the two eggs. They are from the Sahara Desert. They wear very thick clothing, very contrary to what we would understand people should wear in hot climates. When I had to go for a holiday to Jaisalmer, people told me you should carry a lot of suntan lotion and you should wear uh, thin cotton clothes. But that is because I was going on a holiday. These people actually live there. They have to spend every moment of every hour over there. These people are wearing bare skin. Take their clothes out of bare skin by killing the oldest bear in a uh, clan. And uh, they pray, they thank that bear for laying down its life for them. And very piously, they use everything from that bear. Whether it's um, uh, skin, bones, teeth, claws, intestines, inner organs, everything is used in some way or the other. This gentleman is from Saudi Arabia, completely open clothing, open from the bottom. You can see th these are the sheikhs. The sheikhs were always uh, the trader class of uh, Saudi Arabia. So they were, uh, they spent more time indoors. So even though they are from the same climate zone as those people from uh, the deep Sahara, but these, this guy can afford to wear slightly thinner clothes. But again, full sleeve clothing open from the bottom to allow natural ventilation. The head is covered with a very interesting headgear. If the sandstorms blow, then that piece of cloth can come and wrap itself around his face. And it acts like a normal, like a filter 
to make sure that the dust does not go into his nose or his mouth. These people on the screen, you might think are very poor people, but they're not poor. They live in tropical evergreen jungles. Now in these places, if you, any of you have visited Andaman and Nicobar Islands and uh, like most Indian people like myself, the time that I could have afforded going to Andaman and Nicobar Islands was during the off season, which was in the rainy season. In the rainy season, if you go to Andaman and Nicobar and wash your clothes and try to put them out to dry, you will be pleasantly surprised. One week later, those clothes would still not have dried for a simple reason that the relative humidity is very, very high. It rains every four five minutes. So the clothes even directly under a fan don't dry easily, which is why these people dress like this. And they are from two completely different uh, geographical locations, but they are dressed similarly. Mongolia, on the other hand, uh, they are, uh, this lady is wearing what we call Angrakha, uh, made famous also in Bajirao Mastani, the kurta that he, they, that he used to wear. She is wearing a very interesting headgear. Uh, it is uh, what we call in architectural circles, roof insulation. The, the head is the most sensitive part of the body that needs to be covered in hot climate as well as cold climate. And uh, the cap that she is wearing has flaps on both sides. So when it gets very cold, the side flaps come down. And uh, in case of uh, it snows, then the, the front flap can act like a cap to protect the eyes from snow blindness. This is a typical image from Kolkata. You can notice that everybody is wearing white dhoti kurta, white off white dhoti kurta. And you can also see that the labor class people are, uh, are actually topless. They are not wearing anything on their upper bodies, just like those people from the tropical evergreen forests. And you can see through this gentleman's dhoti, so you can tell that it's probably very lightweight muslin, cotton that uh, was famous uh, in India. We have been exporting cotton for three, four thousand years now to different parts of the world. This lady is uh, from Rajasthan. I believe what she's wearing on her arms is called chuda, commonly. The people from Jaipur can correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, if you have to walk in the desert for a long distance, carrying your uh, matka on your head in the deep desert, or you have to work outdoors, then you have to protect your body and your upper arms from the sun. So chuda is absolutely white. It used to be made from camel bone or ivory for the upper class people. Nowadays it is made from plastic. But nonetheless, when you're walking in the sun and you have your hands lifted up, this protects your arms from getting tanned and it uh, allows for normal movement of the body. You will also notice that her left nostril is pierced and her ears are pierced. Uh, ear piercing happens on very specific acupuncture points of the body. Please Google this. You can go to Google Images and search for acupuncture points of the ear. And you will find that commonly where we pierce our ears is the acupuncture point for healthy eyes. You will also notice that the left nostril corresponds to the Ida and the Pingla. If you have uh, done Pranayam and Nadi Shodhan in Yoga, you will know that the moon nostril and the sun nostril correspond to feminine and masculine energies respectively. So uh, in the cold climates, women will wear gold, which is a hot metal. And in hot climates, women will wear silver, which is a cold metal. This is all to balance the Prakriti or the common doshas that you are likely to experience in these places. This is an image from Assam. Again, these ladies are wearing off-white colored clothing, very subdued colors. Wherever you go in India where nature is in its height, lush greenery, you will find people wearing very subdued colors, whites, off-whites, uh, Keral, chale jaiye, Manipur, chale jaiye, uh, Assam, Mizoram, Nagaland, all these places, the people wear very subdued colors. Whereas if you go to a place like Rajasthan, which is a, a desert climate, you will find people wearing very bright colors, fluorescent, neon greens, neon pinks, very, very common, bright reds. Color is actually a form of celebration in the desert. It can be a mood enhancer. Also, it can be the difference between life and death. If you're living in the deep desert and your turban gets dirty or you get lost, a bright color is much easier to spot from a distance than is uh, off-white or this particular color like these ladies are wearing on the screen. An image showing how a bride would dress in a typical Indian scenario, every piercing, every piece of jewelry that is worn has some bearing on the physiology, on the mind and on the body. Moving on to bhojan or diets. Now it's very interesting that diets change across India. With every state, every village, the diet changes. 
uh, we have 21 agroecological regions in India and uh, this is the food map of India. Now if you notice this is uh, largely what we call the junk food map of India because if I look at Delhi it says dal makhani, alu ke parathe. You can't eat this every day and this is definitely not what is cooked every day at home. Rajasthan has Ker Sangri, Gatte Ki Sabzi and Lal Maas. Again, these are ceremonial dishes, may not be cooked on a daily basis. But if we pick up any one of these items, you will see how they are climate responsive. I remember uh, living in Jodhpur, my father was in the army and we got posted to Jodhpur. And in Jodhpur, our landlady uh, Sharma aunty gave us uh, Gatte Ki Sabzi and Ker Sangri, exactly these dishes. And uh, she said, Ke ek khas aapke liye. we have made these specially for you with less spice. And my mother, my brother, I and my father tried one bite and after that for the next hour we were drinking khas sharbat, which was a, a speciality uh, in Jodhpur. We were quite shocked by the amount of uh, red chili powder that they put into their food. And uh, when I asked uh, uh, auntie that why have you done this, uh, her answer was very simple. She said, beta garmi hi garmi ko kaatta hai. I couldn't quite understand that then, but I do understand now that uh, from the uh, from uh, infancy almost the children are brought up on spice and that allows the body's um, build up or immunity against external heat uh, to be very effective. In other words, the body becomes resilient to the external heat by enhancing the internal heat. Also, if you'll notice uh, Rajasthani food is cooked in an achari style. So Ker Sangri is always lesser in quantity. Uh, I remember in Sharmanti's house, their son Naresh Bhaiya, the plate in their uh, house uh, during lunch used to have a lot of roti and the roti was made out of jao or uh, bajra and uh, the minerals and the vitamins came from the roti, not so much from the sabzi. The sabzi was very small in quantity, it was very dry, it was too dry for me to digest. I was from uh, Delhi, born and brought up all over India of course. So wherever you travel in India, Nagaland, Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, the dishes, the kind of meat that they eat, the kind of vegetables that they eat are all very, very local to that area. Uh, you will find people eating meats in uh, very nature rich places, for example, Shillong, Meghalaya, etc., where there are dense jungles. People don't go about cutting the forests and emptying them out for lots of plantation and farming. That's very rare, but they will have a meat oriented diet um, uh, to a great extent and they will incorporate all the local herbs and spices in their food. Of course, this trend is changing uh, very dramatically now. And this happens because we have about 155 soil types across India. As we travel across India, we have 155 soil types. Uh, with the soil, uh, everything changes. The water changes, the type of water changes. And today I feel we are undergoing a strange transition because across India, we have RO systems. And RO systems are famous uh, to remove every conceivable mineral from the water. These days they have uh, modified RO systems to make sure that important minerals don't come out of water. But uh, most people are not aware of this. If you want to know the impacts of osmosis type filtration, then you can Wikipedia that term and you will get further details. WHO has been doing a lot of research on this uh, since 1984 and they have discovered that RO water is harmful for the human body. Uh, to the extent that it is almost like drinking distilled water or battery water. The group right now might be amazed at this, but get your water tested. You may be surprised that it does not require an RO system. In very rare cases, it requires RO systems. If it does, for example, in southern Rajasthan, there is a high fluoride content in the water. Um, the local people very clearly said that that red chili powder that they put into their food actually nullifies the effect of the fluoride in the water on the human body. These are things that local people know. It is local language, uh, um, knowledge, wisdom, and it is up to us as modern people to test all these things and see the impact on the physiology uh, and uh, share it with the rest of the world. These are natural ways of dealing with impurities rather than machine-based systems that uh, uh, now we have access to and we think they are the only ways forward. Moving ahead, we have the idea of bhavan or dwellings. Now again, architecture traditionally has changed with the soil because when the soil changes, the type of materials that the soil can generate to make your houses also changes. The span of the structures changes, the pliability of the mud changes, whether you can make a cob or waterland daub or, or sun-dried mud blocks changes. 
So if you look at this picture from uh, Daro, uh, these are later civilizations. The oldest civilization today is known to be Mehergad, which was the first settlement of the Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro civilization, 7000 BC, that is 9000 years back. Please appreciate and understand everyone on this webinar today. Being an Indian, you are a legacy. You are part of a civilization that is 9000 years old. There is no reason to be sold out on what the West is trying to sell you or what so-called developed countries are trying to sell you. There is a reason why we have survived with such rich culture and things like Ayurveda and Siddhi and Yonani and Yoga and what kind, what have you. All these sciences are very deeply steeped in connections with nature, which modern sciences don't do. This building is a, is a typical um, um, dwelling in Ladakh. You can see that the materials are natural. They are sun-dried mud blocks. If you travel to Leh, you will still see this phenomena, open plots of land where people are drying these mud blocks under the sun and they build their houses from that. These houses are naturally, uh, they naturally keep warm. Uh, they have this uh, plantation on the top, you can see. And the food is very specifically the type of food that allows people to keep warm and extra nutrition is required uh, to be able to adapt to the climate. Today, I am aware of many NGOs that are hellbent on planting trees across Ladakh. They think that they can make the desert green. That's not entirely a good thing because these places like Ladakh are experiencing landslides and rainfall that is unprecedented. A lot of the elders that we have spoken to in Leh and Ladakh say that it is happening because of these excessive tree plantation that is happening there, which these people have never noticed or seen as a phenomena. And uh, to a great extent, uh, they are also aware that these trees are not necessarily adapted. These trees are uh, good for commercial purposes. That's why they are being planted there. And internationally, a lot of people are being told that we can help you offset your carbon footprint if you let us plant trees in places like this. Um, I must also add that across the world, at roughly 30 degrees north and south latitude, where the first set of hot air falls as it rises due to the heating of the earth and the rotation, of the world are found roughly at that latitude. So it is almost, um, you know, it's, it's very arrogant of us as humans to think that we should go about changing those systems and making a desert green as opposed to adapting to it and appreciating how local species and tribes and local cultures have adapted themselves over years to this kind of a landscape. We don't appreciate that. Today we go running to change all these things without understanding why they are the way they are. This is another photograph that we took uh, on our travels to Ladakh. Uh, this again is a village hut. You can see Mangalore tiles on the roof. Um, you can also see that that wall is extremely thick. We use absolute waste material like cow dung mixed with mud and hay, ground together and then applied on the walls. Uh, it is absolutely 100% biodegradable. If you break this down, it can actually be used to plant crops at a later date. This is wattle and dog, which is commonly used in a place like Maharashtra. Uh, very hot, also combined with humidity. You want natural ventilation to be there. Of course, such uh, uh, dwellings require a lot of maintenance and upkeep. Almost every year, you need expertise to be able to redo the roof, get fresh leaves, and uh, uh, redo the walls, etc., with the cow dung and the mud mix. But what needs to be understood is that today, in our effort, to so-called educate these people, we are killing off these traditions which are highly sustainable in nature. As opposed to learning from them, we want to teach them how to be bricklayers. Brick is one of the most destructive materials that we have ever come up with. Cement is another very destructive material, but today we think that we have no option. Everybody is migrating to the cities because they hate their villages. They don't realize that the villages and the tribal regions are so rich in traditional knowledge and traditional wisdom. It is actually up to the people on this group to empower the villagers, to empower the tribal people and to make them realize that they have reason to be proud of who they are and not be miserable that they are not sitting for the same engineering seat that we tried to sit for. Four lakh people sitting for 400 seats. I don't think we would like to push that kind of uh, competition down anybody's throat. Himachal Pradesh is famous for houses made out of wood and stone. Uh, the wood is a non-conductive material, so it keeps cozy throughout the year. Anyone who's traveled to Srinagar would be familiar with this. 
Padmanabhapuram Palace in Kerala. You can see that floor. That floor is made from wood or jaggery. And it is mixed with the uh, horse manure and mud and dal, udad ki dal, and ground together and then applied on the floor. You can see the beautiful shine on it. The woodwork is absolutely exquisite. All these arts and crafts are dying out now. Uh, we had the good fortune of meeting the Suthars and the uh, the Sompuras, the Sompuras and the Suthars. Uh, the community of people who are the traditional Vastu Shilps in Rajasthan, uh, they know all the dimensions of the pedestals, the staircases, the railings, the columns, the friezes, the roof spans, everything they know by heart in the form of shlokas. Uh, they remember them by heart. The knowledge is far passed on from father to son. And now when we met these people, um, their children don't want to take that knowledge any further. Uh, they want to learn 3D skills on computers so that they can build in cement and steel. They don't realize what they are aspiring for. Uh, maybe we can make them open their eyes. This is a Toda tribal hut from the Nilgiris. Again, built by hand, built in a craft fashion. And uh, some of you might be surprised that this is a double story structure. A human being is going to come roughly uh, to this height. If you can see my cursor, will they be able to see my cursor? Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, this is another great example. You can see that uh, these people over here, uh, this temple over here, this roof slab is almost like a turban. So uh, I didn't raise this during the base section, but it is very common to see very hot areas like Rajasthan, like Punjab, um, the Marathas, the Jats, the Rajputs were all very famous for their turbans. And they all wore tight turbans. Tight turbans were worn by warriors. The trader class never wore very tight turbans. Uh, the turbans protected the head from the heat, but you might have heard of, um, there's a clan of Sikhs called the Nihangs. The Nihangs are world famous warriors, they are martial artists and they actually know how to tie a turban in such a manner that a sword cannot cut through the turban. What is more climate friendly, a cloth that prevents a turban from cutting through it or Kevlar, like a bulletproof material that requires a lot of energy to manufacture and is harmful for the environment as well. Uh, people from Jaipur would of course be very tired of this image. This is Hawa Mahal, but the concept behind Hawa Mahal, adiabatic cooling is similar to uh, releasing the air out of a car tire. If you release the air out of a car tire, even if the tire is very hot, after you have come from uh, a very long drive, the air will feel very cool when it is released from the car tire because it goes from high pressure to low pressure and its temperature changes. Uh, the Hava Mahal was designed in a similar manner. This is Fatehpur Sikri. This is magical. If you go into this tomb at uh, any time of the day in peak summers, you will experience a strange phenomena. Immediately outside this room, this tomb in the central courtyard of Fatehpur Sigri, there will be no wind. You hold your hanky up, it will not fly in any direction. As soon as you step inside this tomb, you will see, you will feel breeze. And uh, that happens again because of the same concept like Hawa Mahal. Uh, you will be quite surprised and I am inviting you to visit these places and experience this yourself. This jali that you see over here is as fine as a one rupee coin. It is as thick as about one and a half inches and it is done by hand. And today, if we had to do this by machine, believe me, it would take tremendous amount of electrical energy to be able to use a, a 3D cutting tool to be uh, able to replicate this kind of a skill. And this was done purely by hand. But what I must point out is that this was built at a time when people did not build for fun. They didn't practice architecture for the sake of the ego. When they built, they built either for the kings or they built for God or a higher power. In a beautiful amalgamation of Hindu and Muslim architecture, Islamic palm and the uh, people kapeed uh, right here as you see. And this jali again is exquisite. It's very finely carved. Uh, again, built at a time when people didn't build for themselves, they built for something than themselves. The Havelis of Shekhavati, again, very rich and ornate arts and crafts interfaced with the architecture. This is the Patmogi Haveli in Jaisalmer. If you take a look at the face of ornamentation today, if you see most fashion and glamour magazines today, you will find stars are wearing gowns. 
gowns designed by foreign designers or indian design an iota of sense in the indian climate they cannot spend more than inside bombay tolders are there which is next to impossible to tolerate in the height of our climate so we often feel restrictive it is not free it is not open i'm sorry those are all modern interpretations traditionally if you were to make earn your livelihood by standing in the sun for example if you were an organic farmer or if you were a farmer or if you were a potter or if you were a weaver or a craftsman you would be doing half your job in the fields and half your job during the day after the sun becomes harsh indoors you will have to wear clothing that is climate responsive and uh, that clothing automatically would be light colors full sleeves uh, protecting your body your head very carefully now in this image you can see there's a lot of ornamentation on the face the ornamentation is for a very specific purpose other than perhaps beauty the functional requirement is that all this ornamentation protects the flat face of the building by shading it so you can see all these pockets are very heavily shaded the patmo ki haveli can be very cool as much as 10 to 15 degrees cooler than the ambient environment uh, of jaisalmer which can go up to beyond 50 degrees centigrade in peak summers when you combine it with urban heat islands uh, and the mass that the buildings have but as soon as you go into these havelis you can feel a remarkable temperature drop now modern people will say nahi nahi put an air conditioner put the set point of the air conditioner at 22 degrees centigrade uh, i'm sorry we always encourage people to think in terms of the maximum so the outdoor temperature is 54 and the indoor temperature is 40 you have to understand that's a 14 degree temperature difference that's a huge temperature difference so your body will perceive it and people from here will be resilient and will be able to respond to that kind of extreme very easily people who are tourists perhaps will not but these days we almost change the entire architecture of cities to accommodate tourists that is so strange most indian people want to build buildings for people who are not from this climate zone they will say no our hotels should be designed at 20 degree centigrade so that everybody who comes from overseas should be comfortable i really don't understand the logic of that today it's not about logic it's about sustainable development and energy consumption and climate change and really we have to cut it out we just have to stop that way of being and we have to stop that way of thinking this is uh, alpi and kottayam the backwaters this again is a wonderful example of a houseboat right there in front of you made out of local material uh, these people did not do reclamation of land like we are doing in bombay today uh, or a large part of the yamuna was reclaimed to build delhi uh, that's not what is practiced over here but if we ask a modern architect or a planner or a builder or engineer to build over here they probably reclaim the land and do pile foundation 300 feet deep and then build a skyscraper that's about 100 stories tall and say wow we've converted alpi and kottayam into dubai which is almost what is happening right now as well this is rainy um, this is chan baudi and this is of course rani ki wow Uh, these now fortunately the nani ki wow is uh, a unesco world heritage site so we have started paying attention to this place otherwise of course we would gladly go and deface the walls by right by writing uh, rinku loves sony etc etc but uh, really it's a matter of reflecting very carefully what these structures stand for they stand for community they do not stand for individuals they don't care whether the architect was world famous or a star architect but they are structures that to date across time can provide the same kind of uh, comfort the same kind of resources the same kind of saving of resources as they did hundreds of years back when they were built the britishers also did not mess with indian architecture so that dome shades the building throughout the year hot air can go and escape from these cutouts over here the roshan dans again these are ventilators with very high ceilings they allow for the hot air to escape very thick walls shaded entrances small windows uh, orientation is very appropriate surrounded by gardens surrounded by water bodies so obviously the british did not understand indian ornamentation because you can see the facade is relatively flat but uh, we can't deny that uh, sir edwin lutyens and uh, say if we looked at a building like uh, victoria terminus it has a fair share of its gothic revival ornament on it which also worked beautifully in our climate zone moving on to bhajan or dances and songs uh, why do we say bhajan now this is very interesting um, before the time 
before uh, let's say about 70 to 80 years when we started singing songs of uh, heartbreak which is perhaps the only thing that we sing about today so uh, I, I remember reading an article in rolling stone magazine saying that if you analyze uh, most of the music today it talks about broken hearts and it has been doing that for the past 70 years and the best part is that the heart can't break it's a metaphor it is the strongest muscle in the body it can go up to 250 beats per minute uh, people in Israel have actually experimented in theatres of war and found that the heart can actually go up to that beat rate which is unheard of, 250 to 300 beats per minute. And um, uh, we are actually going back in time and saying that there was a time when everybody used to sing only one type of song. And those songs were dedicated to things that were beyond us, whether it was Sufi music or it was the Gregorian chants and the uh, hymns that we sing out of a hymnal or they were the bhajans that we sang in temples. Uh, or it was the Buddhist chanting that was done in the monasteries and what was also very interesting uh, is uh, this is a very important observation that I'd like to share with you okay, earlier the songs that our grandparents sang were the songs that we sang which is why we had a, a fairly grounded sense of identity where we come from now I don't know if you've noticed every 10 years the sound of music changes so when I was born in the 80s, the music was distinctly hair metal, um, a lot of uh, rock, uh, a lot of um, orchestrated uh, computer beats had just started. Uh, the 90s were all about grunge. I am talking about Western music. Uh, the 90s in Hindi music were about remixes. The 2000s were uh, all about manufactured boy bands, uh, chemically put together. And a similar trend was seen in, uh, in Indian music. And uh, the, two th the 2010s have seen a transition back to uh, very tasteful, very intelligently crafted music, uh, intelligent electronic music and intelligent mu mixes with a little more complexity, but not quite the same as classical upbringing or folk music. Now, we don't realize that every 10 years if the sound changes, the next generation listens to different sounds from you that also adds to the disconnection between generations so i remember that as soon as i started listening to different music from my father and my mother there was lesser in common between my father and my mother which earlier was not the case if we, when i interviewed my grandparents about this they said hey we used to sit and sing the same songs with our great grandparents and it was so heartening for them they loved the idea that this was uh, you know uh, the same lyrics and the same movements that they had learned from their great great grandparents so if you look at Nagaland or if you look at Ladakh or if you look at Ghumar in Rajasthan, all the movements in these dances uh, are um, respond to the natural climate. Phuk Cholong in uh, Manipur, uh, Gidda and Bhangra in uh, Punjab. Also the instruments, you know, like if you see uh, the dhol, it's an instrument that is played in the plains. So the sound can carry over a very long distance. But if you go to the mountains, you will see smaller dufflies and bansuris that are played and uh, bans again bamboo is something that is found very uh, easily uh, bamboo flutes can be crafted out of bamboo and the gentle sound of the flute can automatically be carried due to the acoustic echoing nature of mountains so you don't need to have a dj everywhere today we have a dj everywhere you go to the mountains there's a dj you go to the plains there's a dj and there's noise pollution there's rapid uh, deterioration and disruption disruption of the wildlife in these areas and uh, we really don't care we are not even aware of all these things and how our music impacts the natural environment uh, you will also notice that the uh, um, the flexibility of the body changes so bharatnatyam and say for example odyssey uh, this uh, would be um, uh, what is this called uh, I forget the name of this dance form, but this is Kathak. So you will also notice that as you transition from south to north, that was Kuchipuri. Uh, as you trans transcend from now south to north, the flexibility of the body changes. So in South India, you will find martial arts like uh, Kalari Payat, like Silambam uh, being practiced down south. Very flexible movements. A person can lift his leg and wrap it around his neck. Uh, whereas if you come to the north, we have Vajramushti, we have Dangal. Uh, which require lesser degree of uh, um, flexibility but more degree of stamina, very different kinds of martial arts. I think uh, that's an incorrect statement. Stamina is required in both the places. But uh, again, the kind of food that you eat and the kind of heat and humidity that you have allow for movements to be upright or extremely flexible. 
like I mentioned about instruments, it's the same thing. Why does all of that happen? Very importantly, is bhasha. Dialects, I think, is the foundation stone. Uh, notice that we have not written languages. We have written dialects. The languages are formalized structures that have grammar and that have syntax. Uh, dialects also have syntax, but may not have a formal script or a formal grammar. And we, unfortunately, today are very proud of uh, being uh, outspoken in centralized languages, may it be Hindi or may it be English. Um, Hindi would still be closer related to our local languages like Maithili or Bhojpuri or Avadhi, uh, so on and so forth. I am talking about pure Hindi. And today the Hindi that we speak or the English that we speak is quite uh, uh, bismal in terms of the quality. Uh, our reading ability has gone down, our ability to focus has gone down. There's a lot of research around this that because we are stuck to the cell phone and to the computer, we are so used to quickly changing scenes. You will notice that movies also have changed. Now, if you look at a movie like Avengers or Transformers, the editing is, the magic is in the editing. Every screen does not last for more than three seconds. Whereas if you look at earlier movies, entire scenes which are five minutes long, six minutes long could be taken in a single shot and they would be dialogues. Hey, Babu Moshai. And the entire dialogue would be taken in a single shot and they would be famous for remembering their lines that way and now it's no longer like that. And that has an impact on energy consumption, climate change and sustainability whether you uh, can make that connection or not. Now, the world lies in language. Languages also evolve via the climate and the resulting physiology. So people who are Marathi on this um, webinar, people who are from Rajasthan, Rajasthani dialects are drier, they are rougher, they are more guttural uh, in pronunciation. Uh, whereas the L, the very famous uh, special L that Marathi, Marathi has, or the ZH sound that Malayalam has, or the or the tonality that Tamil has, again, the vocal box flexibility changes as you go down south. So uh, the way people speak change, the dialects change. In India, there's a very famous saying that uh, every short distance, the dialect changes. And if you go to places in rural areas, you will find that uh, over a distance of 50 kilometers, they could be speaking a dialect that uh, neither of them understand. They'll have to speak a third language, which is a common tongue for them to be able to communicate with each other. Now, the bottom line is the bottom line. Most developed countries feel very proud of their local languages and encourage educating their youth in them. So if you come to Delhi or you go to Bombay or you go to Jaipur, you will find hundreds of schools that offer Spanish lessons and Japanese lessons and German lessons. Uh, but you have to understand that if you learn all these languages, then you are also bringing their environment to your country, which is not sustainable. In the long run, we'll end up buying products from them, appreciating their technology, buying their products, buying their systems, purely because we speak that language. And I think the best example that I can give you before I move to the next slide is um, the idea of real estate. A lot of you might have heard this term. As soon as you see an empty piece of land, if you're educated in English, you will look at it and say, that's real estate. This needs development. I need to build a building on it. I don't care whether it stops producing food. I don't care whether it stops giving habitat to an animal. I need to build a building on it. Let me introduce you to the same piece of land in Hindi. Ye ma hai. How did that feel? Did you get goosebumps? So for the people who don't speak Hindi, I just said, uh, let me introduce you to the land in Hindi. This is the mother. And I think that a lot of this argument that we have of gender balance and gender equality, we don't realize that the subtle form of the feminine gender, whether it's mother land or mother tongue or mother earth or mother water is being abused just as much as the mother is. So I think now there is a lot more at stake in terms of us being able to revive traditional systems that worshipped the mother. This is the vowel inventories of the world and these are the consonant inventories of the world. Again, scientifically, now you can see that as you come closer to the equator, the languages that have richer alphabets and richer consonants are closer to the equator. equator. And we are systematically phasing them out, destroying them and overriding them with languages from the northern latitudes. And we are very proud of doing that. Today, I will feel prouder more proud, I don't think this is a word like prouder, 
but uh, i would feel more proud of being outspoken in a language like english and i wouldn't feel very ashamed if someone tells me that you are not very good in your native language the trend is now changing and uh, hopefully under the current government that's going to see a dramatic change in the future but one can't say uh this is a beautiful quotation in kashmir uh, from charare sharif uh, annaposhi teli yeli vannaposhi till forests remain intact adequate food will be produced now it's interesting it doesn't say till gdp remains intact or till hdi will remain intact we have traveled across india we have done swaraj sessions and detailed workshops and curriculum interventions we have collected all these quotations in different languages from across the country and you will notice that so many local languages have deep connections with nature deep respect for cultures and communities and we do not understand it all respond to the climate and to seasonal changes uh, whether it ganesh puja or durga puja or janmashtami or eid they all correspond to the lunar calendar they all correspond to seasonal changes and they are all trying to tell us that it is now ready now it's time to get ready for the winters it's now time to get ready for the rains it's now time to get ready for the summers today you will notice in places like delhi and mumbai across the year you are getting the same vegetables in summers we are getting winter vegetables like sags and in winters we are getting summer vegetables like tori and loki and it is very interesting that the younger generation can't tell the difference they just go and buy it and cook what they can that is dangerous in the long run number one it requires tremendous amount of cold storage energy and uh, uh, it has a definite negative impact on the human body because your body is not designed to function that way seasonally and it of course has an impact on energy consumption and climate change colors too so this is jodhpur and this is south india and this is uh, this andhra pradesh then this is um, tibet and now of course we stand united and developed so whether you bought an omega or a longinis or a rado or a tiso or a calvin klein watch or a swatch watch or a fitch flick flack or a tiffany or um or a breguet it all belongs to one company or if you buy a burberry or a diesel or a michael kors or a mark chapel jacobs or a emporio armani or an adidas it all belongs to the same company why i am showing you these slides is because i have friends from temples of learning the top most management institutes of the country and they tell me that we educate people to give them choice you think you have choice ladies and gentlemen welcome to your choice you think you have choice whether you buy a audi or bentley or bugatti or lamborghini or seat or skoda or scania or a porsche or a suzuki it belongs to volkswagen you think you have choice on the left is a 150 dollar product called the squatty potty and on the right is a person sitting in the indian potty position you want to spend 150 dollars for something that you can do for free you think you have choice this is mumbai this is delhi the tallest bar in this graph is delhi's air quality in the year 2012 that's the national ambient air quality standard and this is what the world health organization recommends for us so why do you think we act the way we do our vocabulary doesn't allow us anything else if we see a flat plot of land we want it to be developed like real estate if someone tells us go green we say okay let's buy leds let's buy cfls let's buy solar panels and electric cars and we will be green boiling sustainability down to a shopping list does that really make any sense you're trying to tell me that because of manufacturing we got into trouble and manufacturing will magically make us come out of that trouble the world points to developing countries and says developing countries are the cause of pollution in the world they are the ones who are setting up plants over here to manufacture 
those plants are leading to a tremendous amount of pollution amongst our own plants as well where we are manufacturing products that are trying to copy theirs and then they say that we will become developed if we come to a consumption level which is equivalent to them even if that was possible let's see if it would work in india so we have one third the land area of the united states like i told you in the beginning when i was showing you climate zones but we have more than three times the population if we take the five biggest cities of india and compare them with the five biggest cities of the us in terms of population this is what we get whereas this is what we get in terms of land please look at this carefully mumbai's entire population is on so much land and delhi's entire population is on this much land and kolkata's entire population is on this much land and today while going through the internet we were trying to do some research on automobiles we realized that delhi has the highest automobile sales in india in fact when you combine bangalore chennai hyderabad and mumbai delhi beats all of them together we add 3000 cars to our roads every day but the road length is not changing the number of parking lots is not changing and these are the kind of population densities we are dealing with now why am i showing you a comparison with the united states of america because we want to be the united states of america when we grow up but that's not humanly possible and the question also arises that what environment are we protecting today people in villages are being encouraged to build cities where the villages are and if that doesn't happen then we will build a fancy delhi mumbai infrastructure corridor uproot villages and uh, not nobody is going to talk about ke bhaiya aage jaake khana kahan se aayega where will our food come from who is going to grow so much food for so many people in a single geographical location so today we have contaminated food we have fertilizer abuse we have oxytocin injections being given to vegetables so that vegetables grow from 6 inches to 3 feet overnight i have seen this in the neighboring villages around delhi there is contamination chemical contamination of our mangoes our fruits are dipped in chemicals to make them sweeter or injected with chemicals and we go about telling villagers and tribal people computer seekho life sudhar jayegi learn english you will become successful i am sorry they are the ones living sustainable lives today we think they are poor we go about giving them injections i remember after one session of swaraj a gentleman came to me from a tribal area in odisha and said my sister in law got an injection for the first time in her life when she was pregnant because there was some scheme that gave free injections to everybody in that tribal region and she had a miscarriage within 2 months and all the women in that region had miscarriages this was not documented it made it to no newspaper it made it to no news channel and this man came and said can you help us out and i said i'm sorry i'm not in the business of activism so i cannot do that i'm in the business of cultural revival i'm trying to make you realize that you are capable of taking all those people down you don't need me to help you out so when did we stop being sustainable we broke one fundamental rule if you go through all religion tenets you will see isha vasya upanishad magridha kasya svidhanam the bible thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wealth his wife his man servant or his maid servant and the holy quran do not wish for that by which allah has made some of you exceed others we migrate that is coveting our neighbor's wealth we want to come first in class and then sit for competitive examinations and that is coveting our neighbor's wealth we want to get a internationally recognized education that is coveting the neighbor's wealth we want to buy the best car that's coveting our neighbor's wealth thus swaraj the meaning of the word is often interpreted misinterpreted as self rule but what it means is self resplendence you glowing from within just like the people we worship five in swaraj again recapitulating is bhasha bhojan desh bhavan bhajan but all these five elements cannot be broken up they are systems they have to be studied together they cannot be broken up the whole is not equal to the sum of its parts so we need to give local a chance we need to bring sustainable development home what's missing in our opinion three key ingredients are missing familiarity ownership and taking a stand for the five d's we need to be proud of who we already are we have worshiped and protected the environment all the while that we used to be called the sone ki chidiya and we did it without computers and without railway stations and without aeroplanes and without optic fiber cables and without mobile networks how did we do it don't ask me that because i don't have the answer to that question but i am raising that question to you if we could do it then can we do it again and maybe show the world a new path remember this country is ours we are part of the problem and also the root of the solution 
we are the only ones who can make a difference and we do not know, need to do anything new we don't need someone else to tell us what is cool our ancestors were not fools to develop systems over hundreds of years in harmony in nature and we have a local alternative to every product off the shelf but if we are stuck to the language we are stuck to the state of affairs we must stop looking down upon what is local and evangelizing what we know we must stop changing local languages and local systems for what we think is best we must stop teaching local communities that they are not good enough and that they will be when they learn and learn english and computers and solar power we must start looking at local people and local cultures as potential teachers of sustainable development we must revive faith in our festivals our folk songs and our mythology we don't need to continue practices that didn't work or practices like sati i don't understand why they existed but we can definitely take forward what worked and what was good because and in closing we are swaraj every decision we take impacts the status quo every time we choose to speak it live sing dance dress a certain way see the future whether we like it or not accept it or not care or not we are the change let there be peace in inner space let there be peace on earth let there be peace in the water let there be peace amongst the healing herbs let there be peace in the forest let there be peace amongst all the gods of the world let there be peace at the source the one god that everybody worships in different forms let there be peace let there be peace let there be peace we'd now like to open it to a quick set of questions we have just a few minutes uh, about 4 5 minutes 4 minutes left uh, till we wind up this session but please go ahead and ask whatever questions you may have if we don't answer them immediately then we'll try and address those questions uh, over email if you can send us your email as a part of the message as well i hope the message went through and you enjoyed this uh, this uh, presentation can also freely be sent to you if you'd like to use it we can mail across a version of this presentation to you for you to take it forward in the way you choose uh, by adding your culture to it So any questions any queries No questions okay great in case you have any questions the email address is on the screen gaurava@swaraj.in that is g a u r a v a at 5 w a r a j . i n uh you can feel free to write to us if you'd like to collaborate we are doing these workshops in schools and universities across india uh so anywhere you think you have connections that you can put us through to please feel free to let us know and we would love to partner with you and take this initiative of your country and its promotion to your people forward thank you for listening and thank you for the time and your and you gave them honestly thank you